so yeah, back to you, Eric. How how do you approach making games that are fun for everybody? Yeah, so I uh, two of my games that are are signed are drawing games, um, which is kind of an interesting challenge um, because some people can't draw and some people can draw incredibly well. Um, so those games actually came out of my partner um, Casey is a is an excellent artist, um, and there's not really games out there for people who are really good at art. Um, for most drawing games, the point is like being bad at art. You know, if you look at something like Telestrations or Pictionary or something, it's not fun if you're really good at drawing. Like it's only fun if you're bad at it, um, and people have a hard time guessing what you're doing. Um, so for both the games, they kind of came out of this idea of, okay, how do I make a game that is fun for people who can draw, um, but also fun for people who can't draw? Um, and so I did that in different ways for both games. Um, in Tattoo Stories, um, you are judged based on the creativity of your idea, not on the drawing itself. So you can win with stick figures and uh, you know, a house that's a square with a triangle on it or whatever, um, as long as the idea behind your tattoo is funny or creative. Um, so um, people who are really good at, at drawing and art can just let it loose and draw the coolest tattoo design that they can. And people can ooh and ah, and they get that kind of like uh, rush of making a cool piece of art, but they still have to pitch it. Um, Kim, like you were saying, like I, I wanted them to have that, uh, that need to also be good in a room and, and be able to pitch their pitch their design. So um, so that's how I did that, um, and it has brought a lot of people in who are afraid to even try to doodle or draw or whatever. Um, and so that's been really uh, rewarding to see um, at the at the booth uh, when I'm I'm selling the game at the bicycle booth. Um, a lot of times people come up and say, oh, I'm going to suck at this and I can't draw and this is going to be terrible and everybody's going to laugh at me or whatever. And then they draw and they flip it around and everybody is like blown away at the creativity of what they were trying to do. And then they start pitching it and everybody's laughing at their story and, and you know, oh man, I gave you this, this horse with a, a horn that's candy corn and it's like a unicorn, it's like a candy unicorn. Uh, so uh, there's like all kinds of stuff there. And monstrosity is a little bit different because it's, uh, it doesn't matter how good of an artist you are, you have to be a good listener um, to what the witness is saying. A lot of times I'll play it with artists or we, we play it with uh, comic artists and, and zoologists and all kinds of stuff. And they get really into making a cool piece and they're, they've stopped listening. Uh, they get to like tunnel vision on their drawing. And so they're drawing like the wrong number of horns or they completely miss that it has a tail or whatever. And so they, they turn their picture around and it looks beautiful. It's a cool creation, but it's not like the, the creature they're supposed to be drawing. So um, in introducing this memory aspect, this communication, this listening aspect, um, you can kind of, uh, it kind of, again, evens the playing field um, with somebody who's really good at drawing. So um, yeah, I just tried to look at that challenge of giving uh, what I see as an underserved community or an underserved interest, a game where they can kind of have fun uh, showing the skill that they have, but it doesn't automatically make them cream everybody else. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's um, Jason. Clever. Um, um, yeah. What do you, what about you? For, for me, I've got a pretty, I have like, I have a pretty kind of like disciplined set of like mechanical bullet points and I try to hit them every time I design something because not only is it, these are the games that I like to play, but if, if I'm, if I'm loyal to them and I stick to them, I know that if people don't like the genre, don't like the theme, don't like whatever, it's short enough and quick pace enough that they can be out of it. Just like Happy Salmon, I think that was a great pull for like a favorite game because it's, it's, it's like totally an espresso shot for a, a, it's a board game espresso shot, boom, and you're so jazzed after playing it, right? Mm -hmm. For me, it's always accessible mechanics. Like, not everybody, everybody understands how to roll dice, but they may not understand how to build a three-part engine, right? Accessible mechanics, uh, fast turns, and um, and basically player interaction, usually hyper-competitive, because those are my tastes. But like with the fast turns, accessible mechanics, you all get fast turns, meaning Shared turns, I love that. I love any game that offers the whole table to play at once. You can never go wrong with that. You just lower disengagement. You you keep people like on the ball. They, they know the turn's coming up. There's that anticipation. And then awarding initiative. Um, just one example from Thug Life. I have a first player role called the Big Boss and you get the big old 3D skull token. 
The big boss is the way you can bully the table. If you know you're in a winning position, you know how to play the game by going fast. You know you can edge out people that aren't keeping up, and you know that if you keep the momentum up fast, the game is going to end. You could finish game build life in about 20 minutes if you really know what you're doing. And then the last one is um, basically uh, my set of words for initiative. Nope, that's it. That's my list. Nice. Al, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, but you should probably skip me for now because we got a motorcycle on my house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear it. No, we can't, no, we can't, we we can't hear anything. Oh, yeah. okay. It's fine. All right. Well, then, uh, yeah. So, uh, question as far as what do I look for? Um, Just for in me, designing games that are um, with, like fun for, for anyone who comes to the table. Okay. Cool. Um, so, yeah. For me, um, accessibility and mechanics is key. Um, cause if, if your game is too difficult to learn, then you limit your audience. Like I love playing big crunchy Euro games, for example, I love building engines and economies. Oh, there's the motorcycle. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we hear it now. All right. <laughs> Start that over again. Take two. No, Al, don't. Um, Al, keep, keep going. It's, it's not, it, what's unnoticeable. If we have to fix it, we'll fix it. Got it. All right. So yeah, um, designing games that everybody can play. Um, mechan simplicity of mechanics is key for me um, because I I love playing big crunchy Euro games, um, but I know that's not everyone's cup of tea because you generally it takes almost as long to learn that game as it does to play it. So like if your if your first session with the game is three or four hours because you spent an hour and a half of it learning how to play the game and not doing poorly, that's not a good experience for most people. Um, so, but, um, and also, the universal, universal themes is the other thing that I do. I'm a, when I design games, I'm a very theme driven person. Um, mm -hmm. when I made Cantankerous Cats, I wanted to make a cat game. I wanted to, in my eyes, finally make a cat game that was about cats because I hadn't played any, um, and I, we've, I played all the cat games where you, you don't feel like you are a cat or it feels like it has nothing to do with a cat. It's just the typical board game problem of we're going to make some mechanics and then we're going to slap a theme on it later um, instead of having the mechanics be driven by the experience that you want the players to have. How do you want them to feel? Um, so for me, theme is first and then mechanics is a very close second. Um, and if people don't get hooked into one of those things, then you immediately lose engagement because um, you know, that, it, that creates excitement. People are like, okay, cool. I love this. I like your theme. And if they sit down and play your game, like, I feel like I'm in this space, I'm in this world, then you have them for however long the game is going to take to learn because they're, they're engaged. Um, and then again, representation for me is also important um, because I want, I want anybody to feel that they can approach the game. This circles back to question number one. Um, like even in Cantankerous Cats, the game is about cats, right? Um, there's no people in it but there are, you never see people from the, from their head. It's always like the body down, but even in all of the art, uh, the art director, at least Spacek and I were very careful to have like, you know, there were Latin people, there were black people, there were Asian people, all in Victorian uh, America. Um, they just don't get talked about because they're focused. We focus so much on like the Anglicanization of it in popular culture. It's all about pride and prejudice, right? Mm -hmm. But different colors of people lived in that era. So like we have like every skin tone in the gamut represented by the people in both male and female. And it's very innocuous in that sense because the game is about the cats. Yeah. Right? yeah. But uh, people don't look at it and go like, I don't see myself existing in this world. Um, and even with the cats we're like, people have different cat breeds. So we had like every cat breed in the world represented like from the most common to the most super rare. Um, and it's not that hard. So I don't understand why like the game industry still has a problem with it because <laughs> We, we literally just like did Google research for like a week. <laughs> and we're like, okay, cool. We have all our baby, we know all of our cat breeds. We know all of our people. We know what people were back then. Awesome. Um, and then in prosperity, it is removing the human element from it and making it all about the, the subject. So, you know, tea is pretty universal and we are inviting everybody to participate in the space by absolutely removing the human element and focusing on uh, in this case, the product, because it's a very small game. So you're making a cup of tea. Um, and just like being essentially very mindful about um, 
how we depict the player and what they're doing and how we invite them into the space. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of touching on the next question too. Um, and it's, it's really, um, and I, I want to get your opinion and Kim's first to start. Um, but what you're describing um, could be like, I'm not going to say misconstrued, but it could be um, also described as like sort of catering to like a more mainstream taste. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that as designers of color, that's something that we necessarily have to do? Um, or can we kind of be free to, to explore things that won't necessarily appeal to, to what's mainstream? Yeah, I 100% I think um, we don't have to necessarily, uh, you know, comply to what's mainstream. The reason why I'm even a, a designer is because of a game called Black Card Revoked that I discovered uh, about two years ago. Prior to that, I didn't even know, like, this independent community of game designers existed. I thought every game was made by Hasbro or... or <laughs> you, too. you know, I didn't know that I could make my own game. And so... Um, it's because of that, and obviously that game is for, you know, for the Black community. And so I think there's obviously there's room for everyone in, in this industry. I think if you have a game that speaks to you, you should feel, you know, have the freedom to, to really express that. Um, now, luckily for fights, I would say for myself, for, as a woman of color who created the game, I think people, when I go to different, you know, um, when I made, well, when it was open, I could go to board game cafes, and I come in and you know present my game. I think everyone assumed that it was a game for the black culture because I'm a black woman, and so we were very, I would say, intentional in terms of our marketing on our website to have a diverse group of people you know represented on the website playing the game, um, you know, to just to speak to Al's point. Um, but I think because I'm a black woman, people assume that. So it's like in the beginning, I would just I would always try and find myself saying, well, it's a game for everyone. It's not just for black people. And I started moving away from that just because I think that the assumptions there and I just kind of leaned into the fact that like, okay, well, I think because I'm a black woman, I think black people are definitely gravitate towards me and they've been the one that I think I've been the most supportive of the game. When I think about the press that we've gotten, it's because people are, are excited that I'm a black woman in this space and wanting to give me the opportunity to present my game. So I've leaned, decided to lean into that, even though I would say my game is for a broader audience. Um, I definitely believe that you should sell to everyone, but buy black <laughs> when you can end up support your community. Um, and so I, um, I think I'm in an interesting position in that way. I don't know if the next game that I would design would be mainstream or if it would be for the black culture. I think it's going to be wherever, whatever my heart leans towards. Yeah. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, that, I mean, that speaks to my experience as well. Um, kind of putting a game out there that's very specifically black culture themed and oriented um, and initially people sort of thinking that that was the route that I was taking and as much as it is as a game a love letter to black culture and hip-hop culture it we we were we focused very much on trying to um present it as an opportunity to learn about that culture just as much as we are kind of uh, giving it to folks who are familiar with it so that they can connect to it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, I, I think in my opinion, we, we are always kind of on this, this balancing, trying this balancing act, trying to figure out, you know, what, what we're, how we're positioning ourselves, how we're positioning our, ourselves as designers, kind of how you're describing, and but but then how we're positioning the game, and that's been one of the trickier parts for me in terms of uh, marketing the game is almost exactly what you're describing. How much do I lean into it? Mm -hmm. How much do I do I explicitly kind of call out the fact that we're presenting? blackness in a board game and but we want you to experience that um versus just kind of letting the game speak for itself um and not really uh trying to to give any precursors about what it is or what it's about other than it's a hip-hop game that plays like a euro uh like a, a light euro and so um that 
it's it, at least in the board game industry when we were playtesting was enough to pique people's interest. Um, but that is not effective outside of that. So uh, I have my messaging had to be completely different. Um, so it is, it's an interesting balancing act that, that we're kind of constantly doing. Um, um, Jason, oh, uh, Perry. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I speak so much to my game because my game, um, when I was fundraising for it, I got a lot of hate, a lot of racial, a lot of, I mean, racist comments, as you can imagine. People are saying, you have no right to make this game. I'm like, I have every right <laughs> to make this game. It's <laughs> my experience. I just jump in and then hop and, and support you by saying, uh, you can make whatever game you damn well, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and when people like saw learning about the game, they thought about it's only for marginalized people, women of women and people of color. And really it's about all of America and about how these structures affect the marginalized groups. These marginalized groups didn't make these structures. They don't uphold these structures. These structures are about how they af affect them. And, um, so, I mean, my, my game has been kind of cursed with this whole kind of preaching to the choir thing, right? Where people who understand it, already understand racism and sexism, play the game or are encouraged by it. But those trolls, I won't call them trolls, um, those are people who really need to play the game, you know? And reaching out to them is, I mean, I'm not sure if it's even possible. But um, it's funny how the, the people who I made it for are the people who are um, resistant to it in some ways. Yeah, I mean, that's a the very interesting and unique problem that I think for the most part is a problem that mostly designers of color are going to have yeah. um, presenting ideas that uh, we do want to spread and um, yeah having feeling that resistance uh, if, if it's they hard. Make a game it's not colorblind right 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 because okay. if they if they go make a zool it doesn't matter what color you are, right? It doesn't yeah. matter. You're not telling a story. You're not adopting a voice. You're not. You're not taking part in anything nuanced. So you just get to make the fun little abstract game, and hopefully it does well, and you move on. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I actually have a game that I'm working on that I, I, will, I hope will look as pretty as Azul, um, but just using African patterns and African oh, that's, uh, oh, textiles. That's really beautiful. Oh, um, oh my gosh. I. I hope I hope that it will have that effect where it is colorblind, but I, I can only imagine that some people will even see that um, and 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 have some sort of reaction to it. Um, and hopefully it's mostly good, um, but we know that's not always the case. Uh, I mean, I, I even I've even seen hate for cantankerous cats, and that's just a cute little cat game. People. People that want to hate are going to hate, and they're going to find every reason to hate the thing. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely it, true. What was like lesson number one in YouTube is don't read the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> really good yeah. advice. Um, and I, this this actually very much kind of goes into the next question. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let Jason kind of touch on this first, and I think Perry can um, speak to it next. Uh, what advice would you give to someone, especially a designer, potentially someone new in the industry who is facing kind of harsh criticism about what their game is portraying or how it looks? Um, yeah, what what can you kind of give to folks who are dealing with that? So one of the big things that brought me into the uh, board game space is that I was a producer for many years at um, I was a supervising producer at Maker Studios, right? And I would do hundreds of pieces of game-related content, mostly video games. And then at some point that transitioned to video, to board games, and suddenly I had this big following of people telling me, dude, this game you have, it's gonna blow up because of who you are, who you know, and all that sorts of stuff. And the opposite was the case. I wound up being like, because there was so many eyes on this game, um, and so many of those eyes were really upset that a game like that would even exist, my tactic was kind of take the industry best practices at the time and just double down on them, which what I mean to say is don't engage with trolls, but let me loop back to that in a second. Don't engage with trolls, you, but you shouldn't avoid the comments. You, you can't, especially if you're in Kickstarter mode or if you're even leading up to that, if you're in demo mode, you should listen to what people have to say, even if it's toxic, even if, it's, even if you don't agree with it, especially if you don't agree with it, but don't necessarily take their advice. Understand that they have it. They understand what the issues are. Understand what these very vocal issues are, 
understand that for every one person that's vocal, there's a hundred people that are not. So, but, and just know that if you're going to go against the grain, you understand what the, what the, what the ramifications are and, but be true to yourself. Don't, don't pander to mainstream audiences. Don't pander to other people's opinions. If you don't feel good about making the game, just literally go do some damn other thing. None of us are millionaires from these efforts. These are passion projects on the indie scene. So I would highly recommend sticking to your guns spiritually, but don't be deaf to the people that you're sharing your game with. Listen and then, you know, make your own mind. When it comes to trolls and you're, there's always going to be trolls. We always have people are just on the internet to hate. That's, that's part of being part of the now. But if you have the time to engage with trolls and, and in the documentary Game Master, which I blather on way too long in, um, in Game Master, I address this by simply saying, if you see somebody that has a legitimate criticism and thought that there was legit criticisms, I don't want to like, you know, go over those now, but some of them made me think really hard about stuff. And when I really kind of dug deep, I would engage with the trolls and I would engage with them, not using their own ammo, but, but saying things that like, okay, you made a valid point with A, but really what you're not seeing is the B. And I can actually name their backer numbers. So I think you can change hearts and minds, but you can fight fire with fire. You have to adopt a more, you have to adopt a very kind of cool headed approach. And, and I think if you legitimately express your point of view, you can make a lot of progress, but who has the time, right? You got to pick mm -hmm. your battles. You can't just engage with everybody that hates your game. You have to kind of deal with those before you even get to a Kickstarter effort or if you get to a publishing effort but really try to be even headed about it and be fair and listen. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Perry? <clears throat> um, thank you. So um, I totally agree with those um, points. So uh, a couple of things I remind myself is um, a quote, those who criticize you are always doing less than you. So if you have time to criticize me, it's like, what are you doing? Um, also, I mean, at first when I did my first Kickstarter for Inequalityopoly, I didn't know what to do. I was so new to this board game world. I had no idea what would um, happen. And I was paralyzed by the feedback. It was, they were just skewering me over and over. And, and you can imagine, I would think they were reveling. My first Kickstarter campaign failed and they were just reveling in how bad it failed. And it was, um, it was hurtful, you know, and I didn't see it coming. And I guess I was naive. Um, but um, and then my, when I progressed more with the game, I learned one, Google everything. Google how do you respond to trolls? And I Google that, and it's very, I wish I would have done that a long time ago. Just because, because it's for everything. everything. So who and when to, um, when to um, you know, push back a little bit. And also, this is one of my favorite things from um, um, uh, on my TED Talk. Um, I forgot exactly what it was. No, it's about public speaking. Um, and something called sailing into the wind. And when I have the, yeah, I still get a lot of hateful uh, comments on my page. And when I, when the few times I feel like I need to respond to it, I call it the sailing into the wind series because um, I've learned that if you are sailing on, a, on the ocean and the wind is going against you, but if you're a very skilled sailor and expect that wind, you can actually travel faster uh, against the wind than you would if it's at your back. So if you plan for the criticism and have a good plan for the criticism, then um, it's it's um, buffered and it's um, it's lessened, you know. So I try to do that more and more, and that's all I can do. I mean, I just try to just, just create. And the good thing about this is that we're all artists, and as artists, you have to just create because you're passionate about it, not because of someone else's approval. And that's also keeps me going. Can, can I jump in again and and and, and respond to that because that was a really a really good answer. The other thing, though, that, that I discovered with Thug Life that was so harsh, especially when I took it to Gen Con, and I'm, I'm thick-skinned as hell. I could take all the heat, all the damage. So for me, it was never like a mental health issue. I never had to like, I was never ever more like, oh, no, put me on suicide watch. It was always just work, right? It was always just kind of the, the, the toil. But the one thing that I noticed that was particularly, I think a lot of people that are on this Zoom call are, maybe not all of us, are kind of put under pressure by is the voice, right? The one thing that I got at Gen Con is I cannot put your game on my demo area because there's no white people in the box. So it was actually a conversation I had to have with the owner of this company in front of all these other designers, which I'm like, wow, dude, you really think you're going to win this right now? Um, you really think you're going to win this conversation? But the idea is, in, I could, I had, you could always, a lot of game designers will just say, ooh, people are upset. They don't like the decision I made. I'm going to be quiet now. We can't do that because yeah. 
if we're going to make the decision and to, to put out something that goes against mainstream tastes and that is going to be a little bit, maybe get people a little bit harder to the color, we can't respond by being silent. We have to actually say, listen, this is a point of view that's valid for these reasons. If you don't agree with it, please don't buy my game. But at the same time, we cannot, we don't have the option of standing back in the cut and being silent. That's something that I learned from Thug Lab. I can't just not address this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree with that. Kim, if, have you felt any of that and had to figure out how to navigate it? Uh, I was not really. I think this is my game isn't like, you know, a culture or gender specific. It is a trivia game. And I try my best to have a representation of trivia that of all different backgrounds. I wanted people to feel like, oh, I, you know, it's general knowledge. So it's something you would have learned in high school from watching TV or just pop culture. So I wanted to have diversity in the types of trivia questions. And that was something that was really important to me. Um, because I think one of my, my quirks when I go to, I love going to trivia night, but sometimes I feel like they're culturally biased, you know? Um, and that's something I think about too, in working in television, working on game shows and trivia, it's like making sure that there's feels like there's diversity in the trivia. So it's not just pandering to one specific yeah. audience or one mm -hmm. community. Um, and so because my game is, you know, it's trivia, so there aren't any people, uh, pictures of people on the boxes or any characters in specific, but that's one thing, the area in terms of the trivia questions that I, I really tend to focus on. So I haven't yeah. received any like negative feedback in terms of the, the trivia itself, no. Well, that's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I keep jumping in, but this is like something that I, I, I think about, I still have to think about this like a lot. Um, because I just want to, I want to make it clear. I didn't set out to pick a fight. I wasn't trying to pick a theme that was going to get people upset. I was like, well, yeah, look, Thug Life is trending super hard. It always is. And everybody loves gangster stuff, right? You see it in movies and television and constantly, right? Like, oh, this would be great to have one that wasn't like, you know, Sopranos or Breaking Bad. Let's, let's, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do an urban one, right? Okay. But the fight came to me. So that was the thing that was like, whoa, okay. And then plus it was 2016 when the first Kickstarter launched. So that didn't make things any easier. Actually, that was probably a lot of the, a lot of the Tinder was already set to have a, a toxic dialogue like that. So yeah, had I released the game in 2015, I think it would have been a very different thing, you know? And, and that's interesting, just kind of uh, contrasting how people respond to, you know, content that's similar in movies, kind of how you're describing in movies and, and books and TV shows, um, but you put it on a game box and it's, it's a whole different world. It's a whole yeah, different perception. The and there are, there are, you know, Sons of Anarchy board games and Sopranos board games and even going back further, you could do like Pirates or, you know, but the minute it was people of color, it was an issue. And I'm only saying this because I had to hear it. It was in my inbox every morning. I'm like, why are you so mad? Like, I'm sure you've seen every episode of The Sopranos. Like, why is this? Why is this? Why is this part? You've probably seen Boys Land 50 times. <laughs> what was it about the, the board game specifically that was so yeah. inciting? I think it was because suddenly the space was forced not to be toned deaf. And I and I know that a, I know that a lot of the pushback came from not in our not in our hood. We didn't want it. They didn't want to see this kind of game in the space. And my attitude, respectfully, was like, you don't get to decide that. That's not for you to decide. You don't get to police your the board game industry just because you have a computer, right? So right. that's always been something that's actually very, very engaging to me to still have that conversation because nobody can, no, there's no pushback to that. Nobody can say, but hey, wait a minute, there's no other, there, there's no other side of it, right? So it's still a complex topic, but um, you tell writers to write what they write and designers should design what uh, writers, you tell writers to write what they know, designers should design what they know, right? And they should design things they're really, yeah. really passionate about. That's the elemental conversation. And if it becomes controversial, then, you know, that's, that's uh, that, that is a designer's yoke to bear, but, but I, I wouldn't flinch, you know, I wouldn't stand down from that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I learned how to deal with it. We didn't get a lot, but we definitely got some. I think at this point, um, it, it's, for the most part, over. I'm sure um, if we end up printing the game again and somehow doing more sales and getting more visibility, I'm sure it'll it'll pop up again, <laughs> um, as as these things do. Um, yeah, I do, I don't have any more questions. Did anybody else uh, want to pitch anything? Oh, go ahead, Al. Yeah. Um, I just 
if it's okay to take a minute to respond to yeah, uh, you're yeah. saying like I do have a couple of things that I'd like to add to the conversation of like do you know because we're designers of color are we you know is there some sort of obligation to do x or y um and it touches on a lot of these things and goes to what I was saying when I was like I back I back you Eric. and um you know there's no obligation, you know, just because we've got brown skin doesn't mean that we're obligated to make um, politically charged content or educational content or casual content or anything like that. Like I, you know, um, my games are mainstream because that's just what I want to do. I want to make cute things that bring people together. And uh, if people learn something from them on accident, um, because you know, they're at the table talking to each other instead of yelling at each other uh, over whatever server they're playing Call of Duty on today. Um, <laughs> then that, you know, that's me. Um, like my next game is probably gonna be a little more politically charged. It's about coffee, but it's actually secretly going to be about, you know, modern colonialism. Um, but I'm not obligated to do that all the time just because, uh, just because I'm not mixed. It's just like I'm not. I'm probably not going to make anything, you know, Mexican themed because it's. I'm not obligated to do so. It's like that's not, you know, uh, or I might not. I might not feel that I'm equipped to like deal with that subject matter in a way that is appropriate. Um, yeah. But the I think having representation in the space is important. You don't really have to lean on the fact that like, oh, I'm black, I'm Latinx, I'm Asian, or whatever. Like, you don't have to to use that. Um, if that's not what you're comfortable doing or if you think that's not just what your project is about. Um, just like, uh, sorry, mangling my words here a little bit. Um, goes back to saying, you know, make the game that you want to make and then be yourself. Um, just being in the space and being interviewed and putting yourself out there. Um, we're not even obligated to do that, but that's probably the lowest bar of entry for what I would suggest if somebody is a designer of color that people do more often, because very oftentimes you see, you know, photos and things of like Gen Con and, you know, Gamma, whatever, and it's just all white across the board. Um, and it's not that, that we don't exist. I meet a bunch of other designers of color when I'm not at these shows. Everybody's just so tired, they don't want to talk. And I'm not saying that everybody is obligated to do that, but I feel that, you know, if you're a designer of color and you're putting yourself, your game and your product out there, um, it wouldn't hurt to be receptive to doing more of that physical work of putting yourself on camera and mm -hmm. getting comfortable talking to people. I know artists and designers were all very like introverted type people, um, but other folks aren't gonna be inspired if they don't see us out there talking about our games. And we don't have to be making big giant political statements. We just have to exist and be happy to be designers. And like that's that's bare minimum. And that will inspire more people to do to enter the space. Um, yeah. It's all about that, you know, how do we invite people in? And even like for my tutorial videos, uh, the two games so far, we've like, we've made this explicit points to be like, we're gonna represent as many different colors on the spectrum as we can. And that's how we're going to invite people to the space. Even though, you know, we don't have any human characters or whatever like that, our tutorial videos are shot with people. So who do we bring to the table? Who do we put around that tutorial video? Not just like the gamers that I know, but even the non-gamers. It's like, hey, who of my friends wants to be in here? You know, who of any spectrum, white, POC, whatever, who wants to play in this space right now? Come be on camera for a little bit. We'll make it fun. And then people yeah. seeing that, starts making that idea less alien. So it's not just about what's in the game, but what's around the game. Does that make a, does that make sense? It does, it does. Yeah. I mean, what you're describing, so, I mean, some some key things there, like being able to represent people in something as simple as a, as a uh, how to play video, like, mm -hmm. and you said you had to pull from your friends. I think we're doubly battling an industry where like, a lot of people don't have friends of a lot of different backgrounds, races that they can include in those videos. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's the short answer for how we accidentally got to this place where we don't have representation is people weren't reaching out. They weren't stepping outside of their comfort zone to, to yeah. make those things happen. Um, but I'm glad that, like, 
we are here and we are being visible, but I, I am absolutely an introvert and I made a decision when I started the company and this was actually like, okay, we're starting this company. What is its purpose? And one of the first things on our list was visibility. Um, so we took on that role. I did, my brother doesn't like being in front of the camera. Uh, so, uh, I took on that responsibility of saying, if we're going to do this, we have to put ourselves out there because it's about giving back to the community in so many different ways and yeah. being visible and, and having, um, uh, hopefully some young, um, black kids get inspired by what we're doing is kind of the point. And so that's why we're going to keep doing it. Um, and I, I'm glad all of you are doing it for sure. I totally agree with that. I mean, when I was making in the quality, um, I was just, just had an idea of, I just want to show this experience, but I had to ground it in something. So I grounded it in a, in a mission. Um, so I decided to make the mission of to spread awareness and advance discourse about how structural racism and sexism affect the accumulation and standing of wealth in America. So it's a mouthful, but it says it all. And um, this actually allowed me to, because there's so much of dealing with racism and sexism in America that I can't put everything into the game. So I had to um, put everything around a purpose, a, a mission statement. So everything that's in the game has to do with um, acquiring, I mean, um, gaining wealth or losing wealth, which means that a lot of microaggressions had to be taken out. Um, but it was just um, something that just had to be done. And I'm, I'm glad we did it. And um, when it comes to this, in, um, within the quadiopoly, I mean, simplicity is always desired in board games, of course. We always game, we all strive for simplicity. But in making an equality reflective of actual life, life is complicated, right? And life is even more complicated when you're part of a marginalized group. So in the game, it is quite complex. But once you get, you know, get playing, it gets more and more, um, it makes more and more sense and it's easier and easier to play. But the whole simplicity of it is, is um, the, the opposite of life. <laughs> you know, people want the right. game to be simple, but life isn't simple. Right. So um, it was hard to kind of, um, you know, um, reconcile all of those. So putting, making the mission of the game was really important because that kind of was everything I could put the game into and as like a form. So it was easy to, to keep it focused. Yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, having, I, I'm, I'm glad as a, as a designer and now as a, as a business owner, I, I was smart about figuring out kind of what you described in a couple words, um, what, what the purpose of a, of a game is or what the purpose of a company is. Um, yeah. And that allows me to stay focused and kind exactly. of going back to what Jason was talking about. It also allows me to uh, kind of focus understand my energy output right like this is complex we all are having to do a lot of work to do what we're doing and um i need to stay on target as much as possible so that i have energy to to do this for another day um, yeah that's su super well, important and also like pacing yourself is important right you don't have to do all the things all at once you know you just you do what you do what you can for now and you take a break and then when you recharge you continue doing the work you know? yeah, I have a hard time with that I'm working yeah. on like seven games right now yeah yeah I got <laughs> you're not supposed to work another game too you're not supposed to push yourself to exhaustion every day I didn't get that much. <laughs> I know I know right oh, I also <laughs> thought of a, another thing that's important uh, at least important for me to express um, I don't know if this fits into things because we're in a free form right now yeah go but, for it um, it goes back to the like you know the idea of like what is what is a, a POC obligated to do um, as a designer, but like you know, me and Camellia's games just because they're mainstream games doesn't mean that they're not for people that look like us. Because you know, everybody knows what it's like to bullshit people. Um, <laughs> you know, black and brown people love drinking tea. <laughs> you know, who, everybody has a pet cat. Like most people have pet cats, right? Like so, it's not like you know. Um, there's a really good series of posts from, you know, the whole BLM situation that's going on right now where people are saying it's not just about the suffering. You know, there, there are things that make us happy. We're not always talking about what it's like to be, you know, what it's like to have a hard life or what it's like to be um, subjugated, what it's like to be oppressed. 
we like petting cats and drinking tea and laughing with our friends just <laughs> as much as just as much as the white folks. Um, you know, I'm not always out there talking about what life on a field is like, right? Just because I'm Latin. Um, I go play board games with my friends. I play video games. I love Last of Us, just like everybody else, right? Like there's, it, it's a whole spectrum. Um, and just because we're making games that are not like um, branded for that audience doesn't mean that it's not also going to appeal to the audience. So like yeah. make your silly mainstream party game if you want, who cares? You know, yeah. make your big heavy political game if you want. If that's what you want to make. If that's a drive your passion. Who cares? You know, just, you know, feel free to, the only thing you're obligated to do and design for is what makes you happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, I mean, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. And I think the inverse, inverse of that question too is also complex. I don't think we could get it into the Zoom panel, but like, you know, some of us, like I said, my favorite game right now is Rising Sun. Al, you said Sulkin. You know, Sulkin wasn't designed by an Aztec or no. a Mayan. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, wasn't designed by Japanese imperialists. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker who made several Asian American gangster films and one of them was very, did great on the film festival circuit. And I was asked to speak about Asian American cinema on all these panels and like, spoiler alert, you know, not an Asian dude. So the inverse is an issue too, right? Cause it asks all mm -hmm. these questions like, can, can, you know, John, not generic guy, not people of color, Johnny make a game about another culture, right? So there's, there's, there's a, it is complex and we are, none of us on this panel like created this current climate or even put ourselves here. But I think they're really interesting ideas to explore as you move forward. And I think there are opportunities to do all the things, yeah. not just a specific crusade or a specific didactic approach or, or not even just pure escapism. There's a lot of complex spaces to explore. Um, and I think, and for me at least, that's why I thought it was worth getting in trouble for. Because there was a couple of times I was like, man, do I really, do want, do I really want to make this game? And, and then I said, yep, totally worth it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, that should be every designer's decision, right? You have to make it for yourself for good or for bad. Yeah. Well, also to your point of, and this, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in. If anybody else wants to talk, feel free to stop me. I kind of get chattered. <laughs> but uh, I was asked this question by um, uh, other game designers that I was doing like a game testing thing with my distributor. And um, the, top, the subject came up, it was, you know, a, a group full of um, fair skinned folks um, debating about theme. And they're like, I don't know if you want to use that theme right now. You might be, you might not be the right uh, skin color for it. And I was like, okay, so as the only brown person in the room, I'm going to raise my hand right now. And I'm going to say, you can use that theme if you want to. There is a right and a wrong way to do it. Don't be appropriative about it. Don't be blasé about it. But if you're going to use that theme, do the research, implement it as best as you can. Don't feel, you know, just like I can write about white focus on as much as I want, right? Like it's not appropriative, but be prepared to have the conversations and have them yeah. earnestly. Don't just be like, oh, you know, like classic example, contemporary example is um, Five Tribes, right? When they did the slave thing, we're killing slaves as resources. Oh, we're not gonna deal with that. Here's a different card. Here, here's, here's a different brown person card that we're gonna put in there. That was the wrong way to handle it because they didn't engage. They were just like, well, that's how it was back then in this fantasy land of, you know, a thousand and one Arabian nights that we're uh, making. And um, we're just going to brush it off and basically ignore people. Instead of having a genuine conversation about like, okay, well, we hear your feedback and I understand where your point is coming from. Let's work together to see how we can solve this. You know, yeah. like, and, and not only, I think doing the research is important, but it's also equally easy to find an expert of the culture that yeah. you're trying to represent. We and have Google you can and reach internet. out. Exactly. Yeah. You just can you can find ask somebody. Folks. Just ask somebody. And yes. and we're yes. th the more that representation <laughs> expands in the industry, the more we're gonna be able to even tap designers who are in that space, who are familiar with that culture, who can who can touch on it, who can help, who can co design, who can consult. There's that's an, that's something that's growing in the tabletop RPG scene is like cultural consultants even if your game is not about uh, Asian culture, why don't you have an Asian consultant take a look at it 
and there might be things that jump out to them that subconscious things that you don't even know you're putting in but like right. just having more eyes on what you're doing and getting more people who look different to to take a look um, yeah. it can be super valuable yeah and, and i think we are all as the like as people who as gamers who love this industry and love this community like we all just want good representations of whatever it's going to be and so um i mean I would say we should get paid for it, but like we would <laughs> rather just like get you to not fail at this than 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 not and just yeah. I'm yeah. I'm just like just please don't make those games. We, there's so many ways to just fix those things and and oh god, reach well, out to the, people. The entire them. Euro game market basically you're like oh hey we're just turning colonialism into a mechanic and we're yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's there's like the so whole many. thing. Pay no attention to these little brown cubes on this boat. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on my rescan right now called Viking Life. That's <laughs> <laughs> that would probably do a ridiculous so well. Now, which is so well. Viking Life. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're basically hitting the end of our time here. Um, so I do want to give everybody a minute to just kind of um, let us know where we can find you, where we can find your games. And uh, yeah, Camille, you want to jump off and start us off? Yeah, so I just want to say thank you guys for having me. This has been a very interesting conversation. I learned a lot from all of you here. Uh, and Brilliant OBS is available at brilliantorbs.com. It's also available on Amazon. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Perry? Yes, thank you so much again also for this lovely panel. You all are so awesome. Your games are awesome too. Look forward to um, playing them. Um, to learn more about Inequalityopoly and its mission, please visit um, www.inequalityopoly.com. Also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Inequalityopoly. Thank you so much. Sweet. Eric? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Slauson Designs. That's S L A U S O N. Um, again, Tattoo Stories is available on the Bicycle uh, Cards website as well as Amazon. Um, Monstrosity uh, is available for pre order. It should be out this year around September. Um, you can get that at the Deepwater Games uh, website. Um, I have another game called Nerd Word Science, uh, which is a science kind of word game um, that's available on Genius Games website um, as well as Amazon. Um, and yeah, to reach out, uh, hit me up on, on Twitter if you have any questions or want to show me your tattoo drawing or anything like that. That's great. Uh, Al? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What was, I was so busy listening to other people. Um, just we're just where summarizing we can find, where find us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, if anybody wants to uh, see the next thing I'm doing, it's Prosperity, this game here. Um, you can follow us at prosperitygame.com. Uh, or Prosperity Game on Facebook. We're also cantankerouscats.net if you want to buy the original game. Um, and if you want to follow all of our adventures, you can uh, follow me at Mentha Designs. That's M-E-N-T-H-A Designs uh, on Instagram or on the Facebook. And Jason? So uh, you could find um, the best way to reach me is probably Facebook. The Facebook group is Thug Life hyphen the game. Not to be confused with the app or any app. We don't have an app, so stop blaming me for that. That's not my fault. And then uh, to, to purchase Thug Life, and we still have some cool little extras available on the website, we're um, thuglifegame.com. Perfect. Uh, and I'm Omar Akil, so if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter, my name, uh, at Omari Akil, that's O-M-A-R-I-A-K-I-L. And for information about uh, our games, uh, Rap Gods is, is basically sold out now, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about uh, our next game, Hoop Gods, very soon, so you can get information about that um, by following a... Um, Board Game Brothers, which is our company page. Uh, and on social media, it's BG Brothers um, on all of the social medias. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for everybody who are yeah, coming in and, and talking me. about your games. Uh, thank this, you. this was fantastic. And yeah, just yep. I love these conversations because they always inspire me to keep going and to um, 
really just embrace this this path that I've chosen because mm. uh, I know it, it's a good one and this just re-energizes me towards that so uh, appreciate it uh, and thank, thank you for, for yeah. Um, yeah, you yeah yeah y'all have been excellent